Okay, so hi, I'm Zoe Chrysler. Um, I'm with Acadia University, and I'll be talking today about assessing the autumn migratory movements of the Ipswich Sparrow. Uh, so first, I just want to give a bit of background on our system here. Um, as many of you know, it's very difficult to track small passer and birds because they cover such a broad temporal and spatial scale. Uh, but recently, as BHF tags have been getting smaller and smaller, we've been able to put them on smaller and smaller birds. So although we can't use GPS yet for these birds, we've been able to use VHF tags. Uh, so with the help of low-tech avian nano-coated tags, um, our lab has developed um, an in-house receiver si system. Uh, so with this system, we're able to use automated radio telemetry, and we're able to scan multiple antennas at the same time uh, constantly, which is great. So this is all part of the Atlantic Flyway Tracking Network, and this was first implemented last year on a broad scale. Uh, we're working with multiple partners in Canada and the US, and up here you'll see uh, this is just the Atlantic part of that. There's also a lot more uh, towers in Ontario. Um, so last year we had 72 receiving stations, and we had over 600 individuals tagged, and this encompassed nine species. And overall for that year we had over 20 million detections. Uh, but for this talk, I'm just focusing on my species, the Ipswich Sparrow. So I think other talks have covered this, so I won't go into it in a lot of depth, but there are different migration strategies that individuals can take, and this can be different between adults and juveniles. So they can vary in their migration initiation timing, their speed, and their route or orientation. And this, these differences can be due to uh, differential energy requirements or refueling efficiency as well as risk aversion techniques. So a big one for my species are overwater flights, which are inherently risky for small passerines especially. Um, and so when an individual encounters a water barrier, they might choose to go around it, which would be a longer overall migration, or they could choose to fly over it if they're stronger or if they know of these alternate routes. And this is where the differences can come up with uh, age categories. So the goal of my research is to uh, determine the fall migratory patterns of the Ipswich Sparrow. So I want to look at their migration timing, their route, and their speed. Um, and then I want to identify if there are any possible differences among age classes. So the Ipswich Sparrow is a subspecies of the Savannah Sparrow. It breeds exclusively on Sable Island in Nova Scotia, Canada. And they can have up to four broods in a season, each with two to six eggs. So the population expands quite rapidly on a very small island. Um, and then they winter along the Atlantic coast. Mostly it's um, centered around the Carolinas, but they can range between Nova Scotia and Florida, and there's a small group that attempts to overwinter on Sable Island. Uh, so although we know where they winter and we know their general timing, we don't know very many specifics about their migratory routes. And there's some anecdotal evidence that, at least in the spring, they can come to Nova Scotia via two routes, one over the Gulf of Maine and one entirely by land, possibly. So it's possible this also happens in the fall. So Sable Island, uh, this is Nova Scotia, you have Halifax, and Sable Island is about 300 kilometers southeast. Uh, it's a 40 kilometer long sandbar in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, and on the island there's virtually no predators of the Ipswich Sparrow. So on Sable Island, this is where our study site started. Um, we had an array of four telemetry towers. We had one on the west spit, the west light, east light, and East Spit, and these were all these all consisted of uh, nine element Yagi antennas, except for East Spit, which was an omnidirectional. And then, just in case anyone isn't sure where Nova Scotia is, <laughs> it's right down here. Um, and on the mainland, I had an array of 15 towers along the Atlantic coast because we know that during their migration, they're mostly confined to sandy dune habitats. Um, and then, with our partners in the U.S., we had. 15 more stations through Maine and Massachusetts, which, which was great because it expanded my study site uh, with great collaboration efforts. So in August of last year, we tagged 64 Ipswich sparrows on Sable Island. We did 33 juveniles, 15 adult female, and 16 adult male. And we attempted to capture only first brood juveniles. And like I said, they can have up to four broods, so there's quite an age difference by the end of the season. So by capturing first brood juveniles, uh, we were attempting to get ones that we thought would have a higher probability of survival through their first migration, and also they were all roughly the same age. Um, and they were all tagged within one kilometer of the Westlight receiver station, which had the most number of antennas so we could get better directional movement on their breeding grounds. So jumping right into the results, uh, we're looking at timing of migration initiation now. So the numbers along the side. Uh, they don't really matter, they're just IDs. But the point is that each point represents the departure date of one individual. 
And I'll also note that not all the birds made it to the mainland. So these are only birds that successfully made it to the mainland that we detected at least. And what you'll see are that all the juveniles left the island between mid-September and mid-October, and all the adults left between mid-October and mid-November, uh, which we didn't know before. We didn't know they were, they were differential migrants based on age classes. And there was virtually no overlap. There, was, there were two juveniles that left within the time period of adults, but that was it. So they're leaving much earlier. So that's their timing. But once they leave the island, they have a couple of route options. Um, like I said, overwater flight is inherently risky for small passerines. So the shortest overwater distance brings them to Canso, Nova Scotia, and that's about a 160-kilometer flight. Alternatively, they could fly farther south. Um, it's a longer flight, but they would still hit Nova Scotia. It's about 450 kilometers. Um, or they could skip Nova Scotia entirely and fly straight down to the Cape Cod area, ca uh, crossing the Gulf of Maine or go directly to their wintering grounds. Now, we know from observations that a lot of birds do appear in Nova Scotia, so we were predicting that they would try to land in Nova Scotia first. So this is an example of the data we got for what would be a successful departure flight from Sable Island. So the blue line is sunset. So right after <laughs> sunset, um, the bird left Sable Island West Light. It flew past the West, State, uh, West Spit, and you see the nice uh, signal peak as it flies by the tower. And about four hours later, it's detected at Clam Harbor, which is just outside of uh, Nova Scotia. And so this was a very direct flight based on flight speeds of, their, of Ipswich sparrows. So just to give you an idea what this looks like, uh, you have Sable Island here. And on the 23rd of September, the bird crossed and flew about 40 kilometers before resting for the night. And then it continued on its migration. So when we look at all the birds together, um, these lines are just connecting the point that the bird was last detected on Sable Island and its first point of detection on the mainland. And I'll also note that all the birds that were detected in the mainland were first detected in Nova Scotia. So none of our birds flew straight to Maine or Massachusetts. Um, so out of the 31 adults we tagged, we only detected 11 on the coast. Two were on Sable Island as of January. Um, we know that they were live. So some of them were wintering on Sable Island. But out of the juveniles, we got 28 out of 33 on, in Nova Scotia. Um, and one, either the tag fell off or it died on Sable Island, we're not sure. But if you look at the, uh, the color of the lines represents how many birds took that flight. So a lot of the adults flew to the Halifax area, similar with the juveniles. But the juveniles, we do see a bigger spread. And we see them flying farther north as well. So there's a bit of a difference there, although it's hard to say with a small sample size for the adults. So once they reach the mainland, they now have more choices. Uh, like I said, in the spring, there's evidence that they might go around the Bay of Fundy here. So if they do that, the birds can arrive from Sable Island um, and cross over Nova Scotia and then reach uh, Maine that way. Or they could cross the province at some other point and cross the Bay of Fundy, which would still be a very short overwater flight. Alternatively, We've seen so many Ipswich sparrows along the coast. We know that a lot of them do migrate along the coast. So those birds could migrate down Nova Scotia, and then they'd hit Bon Portage Island, which is almost the southernmost point of Nova Scotia. Um, and then they have the choices of how to cross the uh, Gulf of Maine, or again, uh, go directly to their wintering grounds. So this is an example of adult crossing the Gulf of Maine. Uh, you have sunset. So again, right after sunset, it departs Bon Portage Island, which is the southernmost point in Nova Scotia. And seven hours later, it's in Maine. Uh, so what that looks like is on the 8th of October, it crossed from Sable Island to Conrad's Beach. Um, and that night, it traveled a little ways. And then the following day, it made its way all the way down Nova Scotia. And a couple days later, it passed Bon Portage Island, crossed the Gulf of Maine, and continued on. Um, yeah. <laughs> Alternatively, we have a juvenile that seemed to cross more through a land-based route. So this one, it reached Conrad's Beach, which is just outside of Halifax, right after sunset. And eight hours later, it was detected in Maine um, and continued on, stopping just before sunrise the following day. So this bird crossed from Sable Island, and eight hours later, it was detected in Maine and then, again, continued on. So based on the timing, it seemed like a fairly direct flight. So we don't know the exact route, obviously, since they're, they're not GPS tagged. We can just go by where they were detected on the towers. But based on the detections from all the other birds that we had, we think it's very unlikely that they flew along the coast and we just didn't detect them. Also, that would have to be a very fast flight. So we think it crossed Nova Scotia at some point, crossed the Bay of Fundy, and continued on. So there, it appears that there are different strategies that they take once they hit the mainland. So this is a similar map to the one crossing Sable Island. Um, 
you have their point of last detection in Nova Scotia and then the point of first detection in Maine or Massachusetts. So out of the 11 adults we got in Nova Scotia, we only saw four in Maine and Massachusetts. Um, and I'll just note that all of the other birds that, all of the other adults that made it to Nova Scotia were last detected on Bon Portage Island. So it seems like the adults at least, once they hit the coast, they fly down to Bon Portage and then we don't know what happened to the adults, but it's possible that they just flew farther than our telemetry array extended. Um, with the juveniles, again, we got much more detections than the adults. Out of the 28 that were in Nova Scotia, 24 made it to Maine. And you'll see a lot of them did leave from Bon Portage Island. Um, they did go farther north, though, up into the northern Maine sites. Um, but a lot of them did leave from the mid-province of Nova Scotia. So again, likely that they did a more overland route instead of following the coast and crossing the Gulf of Maine. So now if we just get into more of their mainland movements, um, all of their flights were nocturnal and they were all flybys, meaning that they were detected for five to 10 minutes flying past a tower, um, with the exception of five flights. And these were all made by juveniles. And these flights that occurred during the day, they were all picked up for at least an hour. So they were likely foraging in the area. Um, we also saw four cases of reverse migration. So what I mean by that is just a bird that was detected at a tower that was farther north. So it was going in a direction that wasn't migratorily appropriate. Um, and all four cases were juveniles. Two were in Nova Scotia and two were in the US. So this is just an example of what that looked like. So Berlin and Kedgy, it doesn't really matter where they are, but they're about 20 kilometers apart. Kedgy is farther south. So the bird passed Berlin, it flew south, and then returned right away back up to Berlin, where it hung out for about an hour, and then it wasn't detected. And then it was picked up uh, flying away again. And this bird wasn't detected for another 12 days, at which point it was detected going all the way down the coast again. So it did eventually get it right. Um, so we also saw that juveniles seemed to spend a little bit more time in Nova Scotia than adults. We're just starting to really get into this. So I know those numbers don't mean a lot. And it could also be a function of the adults reaching uh, Nova Scotia farther south than the juveniles. But one thing we did notice that there was that there seemed to be this hesitation that we saw at Bon Portage Island, which again is the farthest south point in Nova Scotia. So there were 16 instances where a bird was detected at the same tower on more than one occasion. And nine of these 16 points happened at Bon Portage Island. And all the other ones were at different towers. So there was no other tower where this happened multiple times. And of these instances, 14 out of 16 were juveniles. So what you'll see here is, again, these are IDs. So the point is each dot represents one bird being detected at Bon Portage. Up here you have the birds that appeared to do this hesitation movement. Um, and these are the birds that just flew by and continued on. So they behave differently. This bird, 518, it was there all day hanging out. Um, 310 was there for three consecutive nights before it continued on its migration. And then you have birds like uh, 261, where it was detected in mid-October and then not again until early November. So it was almost three weeks apart. We don't know where they went. It likely flew back to the mainland and was foraging and preparing for its overwater flight. But we don't really know. Um, so in summary, this is what their route looks like. So you can see a really strong uh, migratory route for the adults. They fly over to the coast, and then they fly along the coast, and then they cross the uh, Gulf of Maine. Uh, the juveniles is a little more complicated. You can still see these patterns where they're working their way down the coast. But then they also seem to be crossing more frequently than the adults. Um, and again, so we saw fewer adults in Nova Scotia and Maine than juveniles. But the juveniles appear to depart Sable Island about a month earlier than adults. Um, they also seem to take a slightly less risky route over the Gulf of Maine, and they had shorter overall uh, overwater flights. They also appeared to have some reverse migration, not very much, but adults didn't have any, and they spent more time in Nova Scotia. Uh, they also, both age classes had this hesitation at Bon Portage Island, but it's hard to compare them since we saw so few adults down there. Um, and finally, we think that adults likely take a more direct route to their wintering grounds just because so many of them left from Nova Scotia and they weren't picked up in Maine or Massachusetts. So it's likely they just avoided our telemetry array. Um, so in the future, as this Atlantic tracking flyway network gains speed and we get more towers up, it'll be great because we can just track all sorts of small passer and birds. Uh, so with that, I just want to thank my supervisor, Phil Taylor, and everyone in the Taylor Lab, and of course our uh, funding partners and you guys for sticking around for the very last talk and the very last day. It's great. <laughs> so if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them.
the juveniles have autism spectrum disorder spectrum. And there are ways to see that with flu as a juvenile changes into adults and changes in their brain pattern. Probably, I mean, it would, it would be really hard, I think, to recapture them for multiple years to follow the same individual, right? And we're seeing, at least when they're crossing the Gulf of Maine, there's a high success rate, right? So it doesn't seem like it's weeding out the weak individuals because they all seem to be fairly successful. Um, and we don't know why we're picking up so few adults. I don't know if they're not surviving because they have a very high breeding rate. So it could be that after a couple years, they just can't handle the migration. Um, but we would like to figure it out more. This is the first year that we've been studying Ipswich sparrows, and no one really knows how to, how to handle them. But yeah, we'd like to. <laughs> That's the next step. <laughs> yeah, we want to look at uh, weather patterns when they're making their decisions to cross over water. Um, and we also want to, we'll be going more into how they're behaving on the mainland. So I've just started going into that now. Um, but we want to look at, there's nights where it's very clear that a lot of individuals are moving at the same time. Not at the same locations, but they all move in the same nights. And so I think it's likely very weather related, but we haven't gone into that too much yet. Yeah, it's possible. Like you just mean the amount of forage available? Um, yeah, we don't, we don't really know where they're spending their time once they get to the mainland. Everyone seems to see them on sandy dunes. Um, all of the towers were set up pointing over the water and at the beach they were at, so they were all at beaches. Um, but we haven't gone out and assessed the, uh, the vegetation that's there. It does seem like there is, the vegetation is very abundant on Sable Island. I mean, it's nothing but grass and seeds for them, and there's nothing... There's nothing trying to eat them, so I, I don't know why they would leave so early. But it could be dispersing because they need more food, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, we caught them after they had fledged, so we don't actually know the date. Like, we don't know how old they were, really. It's all just relative. Um, and we haven't started teasing apart what individuals are doing. We're more just focusing on juveniles versus adults right now. But again, that's something that, yeah, we could look into. We're just starting to go into the results really right now.